Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. From within the halls of the Badasang Pambansa here in Quezon City, we bring to you this special live coverage of the Joint Session of Congress and the State of the Nation Address of President Fidel V. Ramos. Good afternoon. I'm Maan Ontiveros. Joining me here from this high perch that we have on the third uh, level of the Batasan Pambasa, where we have a great vantage of the, of, of the session hall downstairs, we have a former congressman, a former executive secretary, former secretary of transportation and communications, and now the chief executive of the province of Pangasinan, Governor Oscar M. Orbos. Hello, Oscar. Hi, man, and thank you, and uh, good afternoon to all our viewers. Uh, it is my honor and pleasure to be of service to you all this day. Uh, this is the day uh, that the Constitution has mandated uh, for the President of the Republic to render a report on the state of the nation. You know, um, uh, maybe, uh, Governor Orbos, uh, uh, since you're going to be giving us an insight on uh, an opinion on today's uh, events, could you give us just a historical background on how this State of the Nation uh, address came to being? I mean, is this something we adopted from the Americans, for instance? Yes, man. Actually, uh, in the United States, they have the State of the Union. Mm -hmm. And here in our country, uh, we have always had this uh, State of the Nation. But the difference is, uh, in this country, it is mandated as to the date. In other words, uh, it is a mandate on the president to make a report. It's mm -hmm. not something uh, he can forego, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's really a report on uh, where the country is, uh, where it's supposed to go, how it's going to be done. So it should really be a, what, a very good uh, a handbook to everybody uh, to find out uh, where we're going. And I think uh, this is what the president is going to do uh, today. Uh, significantly, too, man, this is the midterm, no? And probably uh, he would describe to us where we were before, uh, where we are right now, uh, the midterm, and where he expects to bring us uh, three years from now. Well, it's certainly uh, going to be uh, quite interesting. We are sh going to be getting expert opinion and insights on today's opening of the Congress and uh, of the session of the 10th Congress uh, from you, uh, Governor Orbos. Well, uh, the other thing to uh, mind is, uh, well, while it's true he's addressing uh, the elected uh, assembly, meaning senators and congressmen, uh, he is in fact reporting directly to the people in a very formal way because actually he can communicate every day to our people as, as he does. No? But here in this case, uh, there is a particular focus on what needs to be done and this to me is the most important thing for the state of the nation. This is where he sets his legislative agenda and this is where he expects uh, Congress, both the Senate and the House of the Representatives, to cooperate with him to bring about the measures necessary to bring this country forward. Is that yes, correct? Yes, that's true. But even more than that, even for the local executives and uh, the private citizen, uh, this is something that uh, each must see and review to find a role for themselves. So it's going to be a big event, man. Um, okay, maybe we can just uh, run down uh, the new officials of this uh, okay. uh, uh, Congress and, and the Senate. The House Speaker, as you know, is Jose de Venecia, and they're deputy speakers. Yes, uh, this is the first time, uh, man, that there are three. Yes, uh, usually there is one, th right? There should only be one, yeah, but now there are three. And the first order of both houses, really, the Senate and the House, is to organize elected, elected officials, before they hear the president this afternoon. So this morning, uh, they have done this already. Yes, and the, the, the three deputy speakers were chosen on the basis of the different uh, groupings, Luzon, Visayas, Sias and Mindanao. So Hernando Perez is for Luzon, uh, Raul Daza for the Visayas, and Simeon Datuman, Datumanong yes. for Mindanao. The majority floor leader is Rodolfo Albano, and the minority floor leader is Ronnie Samora. Well, uh, for the Senate, of course, uh, elected uh, a Senate president, uh, as we know, is uh, Senator Angara. Uh, Pro tempore, uh, of course, is uh, Senator Leticia Sehani. The majority floor leader is uh, Senator Lom Romulo, and the minority floor leader is uh, Senator Maceda. Uh, Okay, um, people have started to already fill the session hall and uh, that most awaited speech of uh, the President Ramos will be delivered minutes from now. 
Many have, of course, been wanting to know what the contents of that speech will be. It's been the speculation of so many newspaper columnists. Uh, just last Wednesday, when uh, the president held his weekly news conference with the Malacanang Press Corps, uh, veteran newsman Recto Mercene mm -hmm. uh, of Today newspaper posed that very important question. Uh, what will be contained in pre the president's uh, SONA or State of the Nation address? Well, I think we can get glimpse from what the president has said. He's a very consistent man, you know, and he has said so many times in the past that his administration is following a very determined plan of action. The first uh, three years of his presidency were devoted to economic reform and sustainable development, and we are now entering that second phase where the focus, we believe, is going to be on the social reform agenda. That's right. His priorities are housing, education, health, poverty alleviation, and welfare of overseas Filipinos and job creation. Well, uh, you know, Ma, and, uh, uh, after the state of the nation, uh, normally what happens is that uh, I was a legislator myself. It becomes a, a handbook. Yes. Uh, the kind of legislative support uh, I must bring forth uh, in the House, uh, as in my case, I was a congressman, to support the initiatives of the executive. But, uh, you know, the president has done, uh, uh, well, uh, an innovation mm -hmm. in the last two years, which is to submit the budget uh, at the same time uh, after he, uh, well, uh, delivers the state of the nation. This is usually not done. Yes. And, uh, you know, man, the most important document, really, uh, that Congress must pass upon is the budget. So immediately you have a working president that says, let's get down to work. Well, uh, we will certainly get uh, uh, back uh, with you a little later so we can find out how the workings of Congress uh, works after the President's laid the le legislative agenda. Meantime, let's turn over back to Shello. Thank you very much, Maan and Governor Orbus. During the 9th Congress, covering the period from July 1992 up to June this year, Senate President Edgardo Angara and House Speaker Jose de Venecia Jr. both believe that they have turned in quite a remarkable performance. I'm referring to the respective chambers. In fact, President Ramos calls it unprecedented in Philippine history. Other sectors, however, may not agree, citing the simple reason that they have yet to feel the fruits of legislation seep into the respective sectors. But to set the record straight, the House of Representatives acted upon 918 bills. Out of this number, 346 were signed into law. The Senate, for its part, acted on 89 measures, which represent structural reforms to address uh, the government's drive to solve the economic problem, peace and order, social civic, uh, so structural reforms, and others. There is a, a formal body, the Joint Legislative Executive Development Advisory Council, or what they call the LEDAC, where the intricacies of legislation are thoroughly discussed. There are, of course, uh, many other official meetings and informal gatherings. And uh, last week, the Senate and the House of Representatives held separate workshops during which they sought to determine the priorities of their chambers. It was also at those meetings, by the way, where they, they deliberated on some organizational and uh, procedural matters. You went through all of this before, didn't you, Governor yes, Orbos? And, uh, actually, uh, the first order for both chambers is to organize their houses, Yes. Uh, elect their officers. Uh, of course, the different committees are organized. Uh, a lot of discussion would have been started as early as now uh, mm -hmm. on the legislative agenda. Yes. But you know, Maan, uh, I think this should be mentioned. Uh, the most crucial of these committees for both uh, houses, meaning the Senate and, uh, and the House of Representatives, are the rules co uh, committees. Yes. And this is uh, usually uh, the committee where, well, priorities are laid. Uh, kung ano yung unang pag-uusapan, uh, ano yung uh, dadalin sa floor. This, uh, to me, uh, the focus should be on the Rules Committee. But I understand also that uh, when in preparing the legislative agenda, the President does not do this uh, solely from his executive department. He holds caucuses, doesn't he, with the leaders of both uh, the lower house and the Senate to, to discuss with them beforehand, even before he makes his State of the Nation address as to what the executive agenda is going to be. Very is that true, right? man. In fact, uh, the liaisoning with Congress uh, for any president, uh, a good president at that, uh, and this one is, uh, is a continuous thing. Day in, day out. Uh, in fact, there is a favorite saying in Washington, uh, uh, former President uh, Lyndon B. Johnson, Johnson and his telephone. 
In other words, uh, the president is not prevented from calling in any congressman, any senator and discussing mm -hmm. uh, matters that will lead to uh, what? Uh, a legislation. Well, I think now it would be good to find out what are in the thoughts of people both from the executive and the legislative branches of government, uh, government officials and all that. Uh, down at the lobby, uh, Shello is uh, busy uh, speaking to various government officials. So let's uh, turn over to Shello where she is going to be speaking with Senator, uh, Secretary Gloria. Thank you very much, Maan and Governor Orbus. Right beside me is Education Secretary Ricardo Gloria. Good afternoon, sir. Shell, good afternoon. And uh, to all the listeners this afternoon, a very important day of our country. Yes. Uh, the last Congress resulted in the passage of so many educational system reforms, such as the, uh, the TESDA, the CHED, the Commission Higher Education, the Technical Education and Development Authority. However, there is one significant measure, which is a grant of science and technology scholarships to deserving students. What are you doing to make sure that the s and curricula uh, trickles down to the remotest barangay in the country? Well, uh, we are working very closely with the Department of Science and Technology to ensure that our teachers are trained uh, to teach science uh, subjects effectively and uh, we have now a curriculum to ensure really that uh, science, uh, technology and mathematics are given focus in our curricular offerings. And uh, we are working very closely, as I said, we are working very closely with the Department of Science and Technology to ensure that we would be able to tap the bright, poor but deserving uh, high school graduates from the different municipalities in our country so that every year we would be able to have 3,500 scholars uh, throughout the country. Yeah. One of the biggest problems every school year is the lack of uh, teachers, classrooms, the shortage. Uh, what are you doing to address such problem? We are addressing this already, Shell, no? beginning 1990, in fact 1995, 1996. But 990, 1996 will be the beginning of our modernization program of basic education in our country. And uh, we would like to establish uh, uh, bar, uh, schools in all the barangays throughout the country, around 43,000 barangays, and putting up uh, high schools in all municipalities nationwide. And uh, so, with the budget we asked for 1996, which is around 54.7 uh, billion pesos, this could really help us a lot in uh, making sure that we would be able to improve quality education in our country. Yeah. See, Congressman Mar Rojas was able to work on a bill which is the uh, allocation, uh, equitable distribution and allocation of uh, educational grants to uh, different areas uh, all over the country based on certain uh, um, anchorage points which will be uh, the uh, curricula, student needs and population. The implementing guidelines have been out and what are you doing about uh, this? We are in fact for 1995 Shell, we are now using the uh, Rojas formula and for 1996 we would be using this formula also but there are some modifications wherein uh, uh, some concerns uh, that would not easily be covered by that formula on a case-to-case -case basis we are having that and to have uh, I have a regular consultation with the different congressmen every Monday from 6.30 in the morning up to 10 o'clock to ensure that the allocation of classrooms are well addressed too. And uh, in my trips to the provinces, I also, I also consult the governors and the mayors concerned and our uh, supervisors and superintendents of schools. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Secretary Gloria, for taking time out with us. I now turn you back to Maan and Governor Orbus. Governor Orbos, you know, I, we would like to tap into your vast uh, experience having been uh, a congressman before. How much work does it entail to get a law enacted? I mean, you, you had about seven bills that became law. I mean, how much actual groundwork and gapang, as they say, is required? <laughs> well, quite a lot, man. You know, and, uh, you do it uh, through hearings first. You file, of course, you file the, the bill. Yes. And it goes through a lot, uh, let alone, you know, uh, uh, after the House, it goes to the Senate and then to the President. That is why I said, if you uh, are a legislator and you're worth your salt, you should look at the state of the nation, look at the direction, look at the thrust, and file bills, uh, you know, that will uh, actually dovetail uh, the direction of the mm. President to make it faster. Uh, otherwise, I guess uh, it's going to be difficult. The, the other thing is, the work uh, is usually done, uh, well, in a big way by the Rules Committee. By the rules committee, yeah. and let's say of 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 the number of bills that are actually filed, uh, about how many percent of this actually make it at the end of a session to into a law? Oh wow! Uh, 
if you got 10%, man, uh, it, it, it's good. 10%? Yes, uh, because a lot of this will have to be filed. Uh, they will be contributory uh, to other efforts. Uh, in other words, uh, once you file a bill, it doesn't mean that uh, it becomes a law. Uh, sometimes it merely triggers a debate on a certain approach uh, to a certain problem. Mm. And uh, sometimes, uh, in uh, a very ironic way, the contribution comes in another form. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes the chief executive uh, picks it up and implements it uh, through an executive order. Well, you know, uh, um, Governor Orbos, I've found out that members of the diplomatic corps are actually being airlifted here now by Chopper. Um, I guess it's also to override all of the traffic out there that has, uh, uh, have, has built up. I suppose so, but uh, I guess now that you mention it, it's not only the diplomatic corps, uh, the whole government in fact is here. Uh, yes, uh, the entire government is here, <laughs> but uh, most of them motored in though, I mean I motored yes, in. Yes, uh, the chief justice is here, the justices are here, the three departments are actually here, and uh, you can imagine, uh, well, the whole weight of uh, government bureaucracy is here. Well, uh, 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 Shela Villaluna is ready now to speak to one of the newest senators, uh, Senator Juan Flavier. So let's turn over to Cielo. Thank you very much, Man and Governor Orbos. He may be a neophyte senator, but he's an expert when it comes to health issues. Good afternoon, Secretary Flavier. Good afternoon, Shell, at uh, mabuhay kayong lahat. It's nice to be here because I'm the new kid on the block. I know, and we're all looking forward to what you have to offer in the Senate. Hindi ba ko kayo disappointed na hindi binigay yung committee chairmanship for health uh, sa inyo? Uh, hindi naman, dahil sa ibibigay yata sa akin yung vice chairmanship, which is just as well because it will give me the opportunity to learn. And eventually, pagka medyo alam ko ng ropes, then probably they'll give me the committee later. So tell us, what health programs do you intend to push in the Senate? Oh, uh, most of these are still in the uh, general or uh, tentative period because my view of, a, of legislation is like uh, medicine. Na prescription is like a bill and the prescription is only as good as your examination and your diagnosis. But the areas we are studying now are one, the public health code which will incorporate all the public health programs na ginawa ko na sa DOH. Two, I am interested in what may be called a, uh, a uh, national hospital enhancement bill. That is to say, all these provincial hospitals that have been so long neglected, iparepair natin. Mga equipments, basic minimum, i-upgrade natin. And then third, I'm interested in a national alternative medicine bill where, wag lang western, ipasok natin ang tinatawag na acupuncture, uh, herbal medicine, mga kung ano-anong mga type na uh, talagang akma sa atin, plus within the reach of our people. Ganong mga legislation ang aming pinag-aaralan. Labindalawa yan ang pinag-aaralan ko na. I understand that uh, you've been quite vocal about the need for a national health policy. Is this an indication that the health policy during your term needs a lot of fine-tuning? Can you tell us more about this? Uh, yes, but more than that, you see, we've been talking about the take-off point of the Philippines. The economy is already moving, and a lot of the efforts are in that initiative. My feeling is that the social concerns are being somewhat left behind. So, ipahabul natin, one of which is in the health field. One of the problems is the uh, reaction of the Catholic Church when it comes to family planning methods and uh, other related issues. What advice can you give uh, your uh, successor, Health Secretary Ilarion Ramire, uh, Ramiro, as far as uh, dealing with the Catholic Church is concerned? I think he has started in the, on the right foot, first of all. He has established uh, uh, open communication with the Catholic Church. That's wonderful because I think that was, in hindsight, part of my weakness that I did not succeed to get the trust and credibility of the, uh, of the Church and therefore he's doing it the right way. However, eventually the basic issue of the uh, uh, artificial family planning will have to come to the fore. That's when I really wish him luck. But I sincerely hope he succeeds for the, uh, for the sake of our country. Good luck to you. You're now from the executive branch. Now you're into the legislature. Good luck to you, sir. Yes, good luck also. Pero hindi ko pa natatamo yung matagal ko nang panaginip na gawin, Shelly. Ano ho yun? Yung halikang kita on camera. Okay, my pleasure, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay. Mga kaibigan, balik ko tayo kay Governor Orbos at kay Manon Tiveros. 
I think the senator owes me one too, okay? Uh, the proposed 1996 national budget. This is certainly going to be one of the most important measures that Congress has to work on. After President Ramos submits it to Congress today, tell me, Governor Orbos, what will Congress do with it? How fast can they work on this budget and pass it? Well, fast uh, uh, should be soonest as practicable. You know, the, the, the budget uh, to me, uh, Marian, is the most important document uh, that Congress must pass upon. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, kung tatanungin mo ako, even if Congress does not do anything at all uh, in a year, as long as they do the budget right uh, and proper, uh, then th they would have done their jobs. But of course, uh, just, this is just to emphasize the importance of the budget. Mm. Uh, what should be stated here is that the President has started a practice uh, that has never been done before. Uh, almost immediately after the SONA, he submits the budget with a budget uh, message. Mm -hmm. In the budget message, uh, you will see there the, the focus, the thrust of the allocation of resources, how it's going to be divided, meaning the pie, no? and how it's going to be raised. Uh, so to me, this is the story uh, of the whole year. Uh, the budget and uh, r right uh, after the SONA, if the president is going to submit it, and I, I think he will, uh, there will be hearings immediately. Unlike before, this is submitted sometime September, October, it gets into December, so nagaabut kuminsan sa New Year. But uh, with what the president has started as a practice, uh, Congress has all the time to review and pass upon a, a good budget. How vulnerable is this budget uh, to, let's say, the, the whims and caprices of some members of uh, Congress and the Senate? Like I've heard it said, um, you know, if, for instance, a particular sec the secretary of, let's say, tourism or whatever has uh, not pleased a certain members of co member of Congress, I've heard it said, na sige, pagdating ng budget, ay uh, masaslash yung budget niya. In, in, in practical terms, does this really happen? Oh yes, man. There are many things I don't agree, uh, and we all don't agree, and they happen because it's part of the process. Mm -hmm. uh, in the end, uh, Congress can always say, and it should, that the final responsibility and accountability as to the use of the money is Congress, because they are the direct representatives of the people, not the cabinet. Uh, cabinet, in a sense, uh, they're the alter ego of the president who is directly uh, elected by the people. But in terms of raising revenues, this is mandated by the Constitution. In terms of allocating resources, using the money of, of government, it is the responsibility of the House and of the Senate. So, uh, say, it's part of the process. Yes, well, certainly this is uh, one of the most important uh, undertakings of this Congress as the life, the financial life and uh, the progress of this country is dependent on the budget. Well, uh, Governor Orbos, now that you are the chief executive of a province, uh, what in your view would be uh, the dis decisions and actions of the president which, uh, of which, uh, uh, and, and of this Congress, mm -hmm. which local governments are going to closely monitor? Well, actually, man, uh, the local government units are part of the executive. Mm -hmm. The thrust and directions of the executive will be our thrust. So, social reform agenda, the dealing with housing, uh, with putting our own house in order, education, mm -hmm. uh, making the ordinary person get his own share, we will have uh, to replicate this in our own levels. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why, as I was saying, the SONA is very important. It should be a very important document to all of us, to local government officials, even to private citizens, because on the basis of this, you can hold your people accountable. Mm -hmm. uh, the president said this is going to be the thrust, and, and the people can say, you are not doing your share uh, to bring forth this trust. So for us, local executives, uh, even more, I guess, uh, for Congress, uh, it should be very instructive to all of us on what the president is going to take as a matter of direction in the next three years. Doesn't it feel a little bit strange to you, Governor Orbos, you know, having been part of this august body down there, uh, to sit down here now from here, looking down and observing what is happening down there. You've joined... Um, the executive, as, as you said, as a local government official, what, what really um, um, made you want to run for governor instead of <laughs> running for Congress again? Where you could, I think you could have easily won. 
Well, thank you, Maan. But uh, I guess uh, if you look very closely at what the president's going to say, I'm almost sure he's going to say it. Let us look for our own roles and play it effectively. And I thought that uh, maybe at the local government uh, level at this time, we need all the efforts, uh, pull ourselves together and bring the country up from down there. Yes. Uh, here in Congress, uh, there will be a lot of contributions, I'm sure. And this is something that is emphasized today, where the president goes to the legislative. Mm -hmm. They're both equal and independent, remember, man. But the president goes to the representatives of the people, tells them the requirements of governance, tells them of the direction, and reports to them mm -hmm. and through them to the people. So uh, uh, it's a strange working, uh, workings of a tri-department type of gov government. But, uh, well, it's nice, but it should work. Well, we must make it work. You know, so now you spend a lot of time back back in your uh, province, in the countryside. And speaking of countryside and uh, working from downwards upwards, one of the very important uh, branches, of course, of the uh, of the Arts. executive is agrarian reform. And uh, I believe Shello is ready now to speak to Secretary Garilao of the Department of Agrarian Reform. Thank you very much, Man and Governor Orbus. Right beside me is DAR Secretary Ernesto Garilao, who is also the lead convener of the Social Reform Council established last year. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, good afternoon. Nice to be here. I understand that the Social Reform Council has done quite a lot to address the concerns of the urban poor, particularly the indigenous people as well as the fisher folk. Can you give us an update on this? Yeah, well, uh, last year, I think uh, the ancestral domain law uh, was not passed no, by the 9th Congress. But the Department of Environment and Natural Resources uh, had an administrative order that uh, recognized the claims of the uh, indigenous communities. So, so far, they have issued out uh, uh, certificates of ancestral domain claims, totaling around uh, 250,000 hectares. And those claims are recognized uh, by the government. Now, once the ancestral domain law is passed, uh, then they will have legal titles uh, to those particular claims. Now we're happy about it because this is the first time that we really uh, took uh, serious uh, consideration of this particular uh, concerns of the indigenous peoples. How about for the fisher folk? Uh, for the fisher folk, uh, ang hinahabol ngayon sa 10th Congress is the fisheries code. Uh, unfortunately, this did not pass in, the, in, the, in both the 8th and the 9th Congress. And uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, that will be uh, addressed here. Now, again, uh, it will address the claims of the fisher folk. What we're trying to do with reference to the basic sectors is see to it that uh, the policy is in place or the law is in place for them. The programs are in place and there's funding for the programs uh, because that's the way we can ensure that truly the interests and the concerns of the basic sectors are addressed. Tell us, uh, how did CARP do uh, over the last three years? I understand that there are some obstacles in the uh, implementation of CARP. Well, uh, I think it has moved along. Uh, we, uh, so far, we have uh, brought out uh, 1.9 million hectares. Uh, we're now addressing the whole question of productivity improvement in so far as the distributed lands are concerned. Uh, but certainly the the distribution of the lands uh, have been much faster. Now, we're now going to uh, concentrate in terms of our own priorities uh, for um, uh, uh, areas, twen uh, 24 hectares and above, uh, private agricultural lands. We should be able to finish that in two to three years. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Shadow, Secretary Garilao. Me. Okay, Maan, go uh, ahead. Yeah, I'd like to ask uh, Secretary Garilao a question. Some years ago, I was speaking to some people from the Department of uh, Natural Resources, and we were addressing this question of the degradation of the reef due to Ill illegal and bad fishing methods such as dynamiting. And one of the, the, one of the measures they said uh, would uh, help uh, to prevent this is to give fisher folks in the coastal towns permanent fishing rights uh, to the areas around them. In so doing, when you give people a stake and a claim in a certain area, then they take care of, uh, they, they take care of the environment because they know that, that is, they will have the rights to fish there and therefore they will make sure that nobody encroaches and throws dynamite. Has, has that sort of thing happened? Yes, too, right now, uh, in an, an administrative order in so far as uh, the fisheries are concerned, but uh, basically uh, the fisheries code will address that. Uh, I think that's essentially right. 
uh, once you give the uh, fisher folk, uh, in fact, uh, uh, claims uh, over fishing grounds, and that's their responsibility, then you'll find, you'll see, to, they'll, then you'll, you'll, you'll have a new situation where, in, uh, in fact, they will take care of their fishing grounds. Uh, hopefully, once that thing is passed, then I think uh, you'll get the tenurial rights uh, all settled up. Okay, Man, any more questions? Uh, no, I think that's all for now, unless you have one. Yes, the, the, I would like to ask the Secretary uh, uh, exactly how much is yet remaining of our money for sustainable agrarian reform. Uh, I think uh, this is something many people are interested in. Uh, there have been reports before that uh, we're running out of money already, and uh, maybe the good secretary could uh, inform us on the status of yeah. this. Uh, uh, Governor, the, in terms of the resources, I think we have uh, enough resources until 1997. Uh, I think we'll start uh, running out of money from the Agrarian Reform Fund uh, starting 1998, and therefore uh, we would have to get that from the General Appropriations Act. Have we made uh, provisions as early as now uh, to look beyond this? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Napaka-importante uh, programa ito, Secretary. Yeah. I think you know uh, that, as no? a matter of fact, uh, one of the priority bills that uh, is going to be certified uh, is really the increasing the Agrarian Reform Fund from 50 billion to 100 million. Uh, with that, I think uh, we, can, we can finish the program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You now see, of course, uh, the, the First Lady uh, being escorted. The President is here now and, has, as a matter of fact, has been in conference with the Senator and Congressman. Many of the Senators and Congressmen have taken their respective seats and uh, the gallery is uh, filling up. The former First Lady, Imelda uh, Marcos, has also taken her place here among the guests. Uh, she's sitting up here in the guest gallery. Shortly after uh, the President enters the session hall, the session is going to be called to order. For the Senate, it will be the Senate President and on the part of the House, it will of course be the Speaker who will call the joint session to order. Uh, the National Anthem shall of course be sung and there will also be an ecumenical prayer led by officials of the various faiths in the country. Um, I think we can turn you over now to Shello Villaluna for another situation update see, to see what is happening just beyond uh, the doors to the session hall. Shello? Okay, thank you, Maan. We are eagerly awaiting the arrival of the President here at the session hall. As you can see, uh, the First Lady is exchanging pleasantries uh, with the guests, members of the Cabinet, congressmen and senators and different sectoral representatives were all gathered here eagerly awaiting the state of the nation address of His Excellency President Fidel V. Ramos. We can see former First Lady Imelda Marcos greeting the, uh, the First Lady and uh, in a few minutes the President is expected to enter the session hall where so many government and uh, legislative officials have already gathered. It is worth mentioning that although the social reform agenda is a focus of the next three years of the Ramos administration, there have been a number of gains which the legislature has worked on. And among these are the amnesty proclamations, which is one way of governments uh, reaching out openness, uh, reaching out its spirit of reconciliation to the different rebel groups such as the RAM, SFP, YOU, the CPP, MPA, NDF, and of course the MNLF. And this is one way of a uh, government addressing the peace and order problem. Another, of course, uh, an important measure that was uh, passed is also the Export Development Act of 1994. We all know that exports is, uh, the export uh, industry must be made competitive and thus uh, the House initiated a bill known as the Magna Carta for exports and when passed it, is, it was later known as the Export Development Act of 1995 which provides incentives such as uh, zero import duties in the importation of machinery, equipment, and raw materials that will be used in the production and marketing of products for export. And, of, and also, as I mentioned earlier, we had several educational system reforms, such as the establishment of the Technical Educational System Development Authority, or the TESDA. We had the CHED, which is a commission on higher education. We should also mention the fact that there was an increase of the calendar days for school for the school year uh, from 200 days to not more than 220 days and more importantly as cited by Secretary Gloria was a grant of science and technology scholarships to deserving students right beside me is uh, 
Senator Alberto Romulo, Majority Floor Leader. I understand, Senator Romulo, that there has been a lot of discussion about uh, committee chairmanships in the Senate. Has this been finalized in the Senate already? Well, uh, we are going to the vote uh, tomorrow, and I suppose uh, for the next two days, to the organization of uh, the committees that we have. We have uh, scheduled 38 committees, you know, for chairmanship. As you know, it's important to organize the committees as soon as possible because uh, any legislation or measure has to pass by a committee before we have to take it up on the floor. We will start that tomorrow. What will be on the main agenda of the Senate? Will the, part, the shift to a parliamentary system of government be taken up? I think we have uh, 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 stated our uh, very uh, fixed position there. Uh, we should not tamper with the Constitution. I think what uh, we should do is to strengthen the, the system that we have. Uh, the presidential system, I think, is the better form of government for us. We, all, we are all aware that the social reform agenda is a thrust of the incoming Congress, basically the thrust for the next three years. But are you, would you say that the economic growth policy thrust of the administration has been effectively addressed by the bills which were passed into law during the last Congress? Well, in fact, uh, we are of the view that we have already passed uh, uh, most of the laws that are needed for economic recovery. I think what we need now is the implementation of those laws. Uh, for instance, if you are talking of uh, uh, tax reform, well, uh, the tax reform that we need is uh, to, uh, to broaden the base so that instead of just 2.8 million tax filers, we should uh, be able to cut uh, all those, uh, there are about 14 million uh, 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 registered potential taxpayers under the SSS. That's what we should do. Also, I think we have passed already the, uh, the bills that we need in order to help uh, in the uh, tax collection effort, in tax collection efficiency. Because I think what uh, the government has to do is to collect taxes. Uh, I don't think we should pass any more laws, particularly laws that uh, uh, would impose uh, new taxes. I think that should not be done. What we should do is uh, collect the taxes that are already covered by the laws that we have. Okay, thank you very much, Senator Alberto Romulo. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, turn, I now turn you back to Maan and Governor Orbus. Thank you very much, Shelo. You know, back again to the State of the Nation address, Governor Orbo, since that is really uh, the, the business of the day. Uh, you have already stated that this should really be like the guidebook and the handbook or the manual for every uh, legislator, for every senator and every congressman, because it's going to lay down the direction by which the president or chief executive sees this country going. But what goes into the making of the State of the Nation address? I know everybody's going to be dissecting it, how many times he was applauded, uh -huh. what kind of style was it, whether it had a fire in his belly type the, of the rhetoric, tone. Uh -huh. the tone, mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to be analyzed and overanalyzed. How does, you've been an executive secretary, <laughs> so you've seen the workings of uh, the presidency from within. How, how, what is the process of making this, preparing this very, very important uh, piece of speech? Well, uh, quite a lot of activity, Ma, and I, I, uh, as you can imagine, uh, it is a report uh, on the nation. So, uh, theoretically, the president will have his inputs from uh, the bureaucracies on cabinet members. More or less, they lay out uh, where they were, where they want to go, what the requirements are in terms of uh, legislation. And in the end, uh, put it all together, uh, sometimes uh, we miss the point because it's all a report on the, their supposed quote-unquote achievements. But this is a necessary part of uh, any report. So what happens is that uh, this president again uh, uh, tried uh, to separate uh, the technical report, meaning uh, the achievements of the other officers, so that it will not actually well uh, model... Yes, and unmodeled the main message of his state of the nation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, qu quite a lot. Uh, he, he consults uh, the private sector, uh, of course, uh, the legislators. But in the end, it's really his own gut feel on where he would like uh, to bring the country. And while many people think that, uh, well, it's just one of the speeches, uh, to me, my own experience in government, both as, uh, well, a worker uh, in the cabinet uh, and now as a local executive uh, and uh, as a legislator, 
uh, the state of the nation tells a lot on what will happen uh, in the coming years. You know, observing uh, uh, President uh, Fidel V. Ramos, he, he has been very consistent from the first day that he has taken his office. As a matter of fact, even when he was just running for office, he's always emphasized teamwork, he's always in unity. emphasized unity and discipline. And he, he requires that from all the people that work for him. They must be team players. Uh, yeah, in fact, uh, Maren, uh, I think uh, the fact that there is a need for team play here is brought out by the fact that uh, all three departments are here. We must play as a team, uh, otherwise we'll get nowhere. And uh, uh, the president, uh, as far as I know him, uh, is one who demands uh, sacrifice. What, what then uh, do you think is the role of the opposition? I mean, they, you know, um, uh, they're supposed to be fiscalizers in a sense, but at the same time, since they must also participate in steering this boat forward, as they say, they must also be team players. So, I mean, what is the role of an opposition senator and opposition congressman? How do you still um, uh, adhere to this sense of uh, unity and teamwork for the country and at the same time be a fiscalizer? Well, Maren, uh, it's part of the democratic process. Uh, in the search for a solution, uh, the alternatives must be debated. In fact, even the direction we must uh, debate. But having agreed on a direction, for instance, we can still debate on the approaches uh, towards that direction. So there is, in fact, uh, shall we say, a vital need for an opposition. Uh, just uh, because, uh, well, the, all points of views uh, must be considered. Well, let's consider some more points of views and turn you back to Shello, who is going to be uh, interviewing uh, Congressman Salvador Escudero. Thank you, Man and Governor Orbus. Right beside me is the incoming and outgoing Chairman of the Congressional Committee on Education, Congressman Salvador Escudero. But before we talk about his plans for the Education Committee and for the Department of Education as a whole, well, as far as educational reforms uh, are concerned, there is a plan, Congressman and tell us how true is this to designate three new posts, which is a creation of three deputy speakers in the House of Representatives. How true is this plan and what is your reaction to such? It's no longer a plan, Shello. We already elected our three deputy speakers this uh, early this afternoon in the person of uh, Congressman Daza, Nani Perez, and Simeon Datumanong. Personally, I look at it as a streamlining so that uh, the whole body can move really as one without uh, stifling the ideas of uh, the minority, but to hasten the passage of quality bills by having three additional or two additional persons to help out the speaker. But strictly speaking, it will actually be three additional persons because the job of the old speaker pro tem was really merely to preside over the session whenever the speaker is physically unable. Do you agree with how Speaker Jose de Venetia's view that this is one way of decentralizing power in Congress? Oh yes, in fact he used the word devolution. He devolved uh, some of his uh, powers and I think in the end this will really work to the advantage of the House of Representatives. Okay, so tell us, what are your plans as incoming uh, chairman of the Committee on Education here in the House of Representatives. Uh, last uh, ninth Congress, we managed to pass 70% of what we call the EDCOM bills. These were the bills recommended by the uh, Congressional Education Commission. This 10th uh, Congress, we intend to uh, pass the remaining 30%. Basically, the objective is to improve the quality, the relevance of Philippine education. Last uh, nine Congress, we restructured DECs. That's why we already have the Commission on Higher Education, the Technical and the Skills Development Authority. And in this 10th Congress, we intend to pass the creation of a Department of Basic Education because we want to make basic education, elementary and high school, mandatory, shallow. And not only mandatory, we want to assure every Filipino who finishes high school that indeed he finished not only a relevant secondary education but a quality of education everybody can be proud of. Okay, thank you very much uh, Congressman Salvador Escudero and back to you Maan and Governor Orbos. Thank you very much Cielo. You know uh, Governor Orbos, uh, the President as you know is an indefatigable person. I mean he has, he has not 
paid lip service to this thing of country countryside development. He, he has, as a matter of fact, really proven it time and time again that he believes Manila is not the Philippines. Uh, you know, the whole country must uh, develop, and he has made countless, countless trips to the provinces. Um, you have you have uh, witnessed this. You still now you travel with him again in the provinces. Tell us what. What is the importance of these trips? I mean, um, particularly to the local people, uh, how important is it to see the the highest officer of the land in in a small barrio? I mean, uh, or is it better for the president to stay safe and secure in Malacanang? What is your no, opinion? No, no, man. Uh, in fact, uh, other than the well, the psychological and the people really would like to see their president with them. Uh, the trips of the president actually brings with him the whole weight of bureaucracy and the focus of resources on a particular area. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it is a shortcut on uh, the whole bureaucracy. This is how I look at it. And uh, it brings uh, the resources of government to a particular area and addresses the problems immediately. So uh, the more trips the president uh, would make, the more uh, these are focused. You know, it's really an indictment on the whole system. You know? mm -hmm. Because kung hindi pupunta yung presidente, uh, hindi madadala yung buong gobyerno. But, uh, the president has no choice. Uh, the, the government is just so big, the country is just so big, and the problems are so numerous mm -hmm. that he needs to go down there and really bring government to the people. Uh, in that sense, uh, it has its good effect. He, he usually, when he travels, he, he does bring key officials with him, you know, the different secretaries uh, or key undersecretaries of different branches of, of government. Uh, government. Uh, can you, uh, of his cabinet, rather. Can you, can you tell us some uh, insights as to, you know, personal experiences you've had? Well, not only that, man. When a president brings a government official, it means that he's going to do his homework. It is he's going to do his homework. Yes. In other words, let's say I'm going to Pangasinan and the president brings me there. Uh, I have to look at my own what uh, plans and projects, what's in Pangasinan, what's holding it. In other words, it becomes a problem-solving trip. And uh, any, any government official who is brought by the president and he's put on test there and he does not know what he's talking about, uh, well, uh, he will just cry. So uh, it is good that the president makes these trips. I think he has made something like uh, more than 500 trips uh, to everywhere already uh, uh, in the Philippines. Well, you know, I noticed that uh, one of the special topics uh, uh, in, in the media always uh, is uh, the president's foreign trips. Um, what, what is your insight and what is your opinion on, on these trips? Um, the, the president has said that from the very beginning that he is going to be this country's best salesman to bring in foreign investment and he he's a very hands-on man just like he goes to the provinces he feels that he has to have eyeball to eyeball contact uh, with his counterparts around the world and give them the good news that you know the Philippines is back in business and uh, this uh -huh. is what we have to offer you know man uh, I think I should say what has not been said you know in fairness to the president this is not something that happens uh, because he thought of it uh, out of the blue. Uh, at the start, he said it. I'm going to make diplomacy work for our development. And he, sa he said, I'm going to make these visits. Mm -hmm. It is not something that, ah, dito siya pupunta kasi gusto niya, etc., etc. As you said, uh, he's a man of planned action. So uh, I don't think uh, uh, he should be judged unfairly, and he should be judged fairly by the results of his trips. And so far, my own objective view is that uh, they have resulted into something net positive for all of us. Have you have you, have you ever been on one of his state visits? No, no, uh, I, not yet, uh, man. <laughs> well, uh, I have I have been on uh, two uh, uh. in China and in Indonesia, and I can assure you, a lot of the business delegation that have traveled with the president on uh, on those trips know that it is no junket. I mean, it is no easy thing to travel mm -hmm. with this, uh, this president who is just indefatigable because the schedules are so tight. You know, calls are at like 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. You have to put your suitcase outside. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it, it's a run, run, run uh, situation. Well, uh, just to re-emphasize though, uh, this is all planned. This year, he, he went to these countries. Next year, these are the goals and objectives. Uh, it seems to me that uh, this has been his plan uh, from the very start. So, as I said, I don't think anyone should fault him for making those plans and getting the results, no? Uh, the important thing is uh, when we make visits, 
uh, there is a desired result. And this to me uh, is something that he should be judged uh, of. So, uh, so far, as I said, it's, it's a net positive for the country. People have taken their positions. Is there also a protocol as to who may stay in that main uh, hall downstairs where the, the congressmen are? Well, again, uh, it should really be just the legislators, the senators and the congressmen and, and the former senators and congressmen and who are allowed to walk around uh, uh, the session floor. So, in other words, even high-ranking cabinet members are really uh, technically not uh, to be loitering down there. Well, and, uh, technically, yes. Well, uh, let's turn over to Shello. She's got a better vantage point down there. Uh, so we watch our chief executive entering the hall. Shello. Thank you, Mon and Governor Orbus. As we can see, the president is just about to enter the session hall of the House of Representatives. We can hear from the loudspeaker the announcement from an official here in the House of Representatives announcing the arrival of President Fidel V. Ramos into the session hall of the House of Representatives. The president is looking very fine in his piña barong and so does the first lady in her Filipina dress. Accompanying the president and his party is Senate President Edgardo Angara as well as House Speaker Ased Venesha, who were on hand earlier to meet the president on board his presidential chopper. In a few minutes, after the exchange of pleasantries and greetings customary in all political gatherings like this, the session will be called to order. For the Senate, it will be called to order by Senate President Edgardo Angara and for the House by Speaker Ossed Venesha. The President is in high spirits, perhaps an indication that he is optimistic and hopeful that this 10th Congress will be a dynamic and productive one. The Chief Executive has been quoted as saying that he is satisfied with the outcome of the elections, but now the area of focus should be getting down to the serious business of lawmaking. This occasion not only marks the midpoint of the Ramos presidency, but the assumption into office of 204 congressmen, 12 senators, and 14,000 local government executives. Prior to today's opening of Congress, both the Senate and the House held their respective workshops, the aim of which is to draw up a legislative agenda to make the lawmaking process efficient and hopefully on track with the schedule they have set out for themselves. Let's pause for a few moments to listen to the Philippine National Anthem. On the part of the Senate, the joint session of Congress is hereby open. On the part of the House of Representatives, the joint session is now called to order. I request everybody to remain standing for the national anthem. I order to please remain standing for the nation's prayer.
Mangyari po ang pakiyoko natin ang ating mga ulo at tayo po'y mananalang. Ama namin pong banal na makapangyarihan sa lahat, kami po ay nagpapasalamat sa iyo ngayon na muli kaming nabigyan ng ganitong pagkakataon na magtipon-tipon ngayon sa bulwagang ito ng Kongreso. Alam po namin na sa iyo nagmumula ang lahat ng mga biyaya at kami po ay pinagkaisa ninyo ngayon at pinili upang simulan ang ganitong mahalagang tungkulin na iyong itinakda para sa amin lalo na po sa mga mambabatas namin. Pakinggan niyo po sana ang aming samo na ang bawat isa sa amin ay inyong mapagkalooban ng sapat na tibay ng loob harapin ang lahat ng pagsubok ng panahon. Pagkalooban ninyo po kami ng inyong biyaya upang hindi namin malimutan ang kapakanan ng sambayanang Pilipino, lalong-lalo na ang mga nagdarahop at inaapi. Upang tuluyang magkaisa kasama ng lahat ng aming mga pinuno at ng iba't ibang sektor sa aming bayan, tungo sa pagunlad hindi lamang ng aming ekonomiya, ngunit pati na ng aming mga panloob na pananaw at hangarin, upang ang lahat ng ito'y maging kalugod-lugod at sangayon sa iyong mithiin. Inialay po namin sa inyo ang lahat ng tagumpay na maaari naming makamit at lubos kaming umaasa sa inyong gabay at pagunawa sa lahat ng aming mga kahinaan. Bigyan niyo po sana kami ng sapat na tatag ng loob na maging karapat-dapat na mga lingkod bayan, lalong-lalo na sa mga mamamayang nagbibigay tiwala sa amin. Lahat ng ito ay ipinaaabot namin sa inyo sapagkat sa inyo ang kaharian, kaluwalhatian at kapangyarihan magpasawalang hanggan. Siya nawa. Ladies and gentlemen of the Congress of the Philippines, His Excellency Fidel V. Ramos, the President of the Republic of the Philippines. Mr. Senate President, Mr. Speaker, distinguished members of the Senate and of the House of Representatives constituting the 10th Congress of the Philippines, distinguished members of the Supreme Court and the Judiciary, my co-workers in the Cabinet, the local government executives, your Excellencies of the Diplomatic Corps, NGOs, people's organizations, other special guests, fellow workers in government. Ladies and gentlemen, mga mahal na kababayan at kapatid. Ang pagunlad sa alinmang bagay upang makamtan dapat ay may sapat na puhunan Ang ilan dito ay taus-pusong pagsisikap, tiyaga, at pakikipagtulungan. Noong lumipas na panahon, hindi natumbasan 
ang kinakailangang puhunan upang mapaunlad ang buong Pilipinas. Development, ladies and gentlemen, we are often told, has a price that must be paid by those who want it. In the past, because we had been unwilling to pay that price, our nation could only falter and decline. Today, we are a more capable people and a more capable country because these past three years, we have paid a substantial down payment on development. The reforms we have dared to carry out, the hardships we have endured, the gains we have won, all these will reap benefits of progress. Again and again over these three years, we Filipinos have shown ourselves and the world that the Filipino can succeed in the struggle for development, carry ambitious programs to their conclusion, and succeed, not by taking the authoritarian route, but by democratic consensus and collective effort. The story of our turnaround I have detailed in an accompanying technical report, which I submit for the congressional record. I also submit today, 30 days ahead of the traditional deadline, the proposed 1996 General Appropriations Act with my budget message. The budget we see as our country's bridge to the 21st century. In preparing it, we were guided by two things. First, that the only way to deal with limited resources is to have infinite resourcefulness. <laughs> Second, our concern is not just to count every peso, but to make every peso count. Our economy is growing. This time, growth is driven by investment and exports, not by consumer spending. Inflation we have kept at single-digit levels, and interest rates are decreasing. And for a change, we see the peso rise instead of decline. Political stability underpins our turnaround. We held two successful elections these past three years, proving Philippine democracy is no longer fragile as it once was. And now we have gone some way in placing the common tao at the center of our development efforts, both as agent and as beneficiary. We have made diplomacy a tool for development. We are riding the wave of globalization and winning for ourselves a place of respect in the family of nations. Yet, these are only foundations to build on. Our work is far from over. The suspension of civil conflict is not peace, and the containment of crime is not order. Two years of growth do not add up to modernization, and the free market economy does not necessarily work like the rising tide, which equally lifts all boats. Over these next three years, we have three or six major tasks. One, we must adapt to the competitive world economy. Two, we must reform our electoral system to cut down the power of money politics and to bring together, in the words of Pope John Paul II, and I quote, the realms of private conscience and of public conduct, unquote. Three, we must stamp out criminality and its associated evils, corruption in the bureaucracy and police, and laxity in the justice system. Four, we must prevent poverty from perpetuating itself. Five, we must acquire the capability and self-reliance to account for ourselves in the world. And six, 
We must raise the quality and integrity of our governance because only the competent and responsible exercise of authority can bring about our country's modernization. Let me elaborate on these top priority tasks. The continued expansion and modernization of the economy must be our primordial concern. This early, we must ask ourselves, can we catch up and then keep in step with our vigorous neighbors? If we fail to adapt to new economic realities, we will lag even further behind. Worse, we may fritter away the gains we have already won. How then do we squarely face this challenge? How do we stay on track and accelerate our advance? God helps those who help themselves. Our economic turnaround is an achievement created with God's help by our people's labor and will. All that government can justly claim is that it has begun to create the environment in which business can flourish, workers can create wealth, and secure for themselves a just share of it. We must press on with deregulation and liberalization and bring down the last of our self-imposed barriers to economic growth left over from the age of protectionism. The other day, I issued Executive Order Number 264, promulgating a tariff reduction program that accelerates our economy's, our e economy's outward orientation. Now I propose this Congress repeal the remaining laws, some enacted almost half a century ago, that still limit economic growth and deny consumers access to quality goods at lower prices. For example, in retail trade, the restriction designed in 1954 to protect Filipino businessmen from non-Filipino competitors had long been overtaken by events. The once alien competitors have all become fellow Filipinos, yet the old law ironically protects them from potential competition from the outside to the prejudice of our consumers. Five other laws that should have been repealed or amended long ago include the Investment Company Act of 1960, which contains a provision requiring all directors of investment companies to be citizens. Although, strangely enough, the same law does not restrict foreign equity in these companies. For 35 years, ladies and gentlemen, this restrictive provision of law has prevented foreign investors from establishing mutual funds in our country. Now, with the lifting of foreign exchange controls, the Uniform Currency Act of 1950 should now be repealed to allow a free market in international financing and trading transactions. I also ask Congress to repeal the minimum capital requirements for foreign investors in wholesale and export enterprises under negative list B and to delete entirely negative list C of the Foreign Investments Act of 1991. And I further ask Congress to amend the Financing Company Act of 1969 and the Investment Houses Act of 1973 to allow unrestricted foreign investment in finance companies and investment houses. Moreover, we must take the necessary steps now to ensure the rapid development and expansion of our domestic capital market. With this further economic liberalization, Metro Manila can now compete to become a financial and trading center in Southeast Asia. And our archipelago can aspire to become a landmark in the borderless world of the future. Let us not delude ourselves. It is a brutally competitive economic order emerging out there. 
Many lean and hungry peoples are being integrated into the global economy. Competition is particularly fierce for trade and investments. And the countries most likely to capture these investments are those that set out the appropriate policies. We are fully committed to meet our commitments under the World Trade Organization, including the upholding of intellectual property rights in accordance with international conventions. Ultimately, the pace of growth will depend on how solidly we build our platform for takeoff. That platform will be stable only if it is built on the rock of peace, civil order, and social harmony. This is why we have offered peace with honor to the military rebels, radical insurgents, and southern secessionists. We knew from the start the road to peace would be long and hard, but the alternative of bloody conflict and terrorism is worse. The initial successes of our peace initiatives are evident. The chairman of the Moro National Liberation Front, or MNLF, campaigning peaceably in our southern provinces for a Muslim autonomous region. And the commander of the military rebels, now belonging to this august body as an elected senator of the republic. Ladies and gentlemen of the 10th Congress, if the peace process is to be a test of government's patience and forbearance, then I assure you, we have patience and forbearance enough, and above all, the will to forge a just settlement that will endure. And if it is to be a test of our courage and steadfastness, why then, we have that courage and steadfastness also. In our pilgrimage for peace, you can count on government to walk the extra mile. But with the misguided few among our countrymen who have associated themselves with international terrorism, we will be much less patient and definitely more firm. <laughs> Political fanatics no one can reach through reason and compromise. This is why I ask this Congress to pass an anti-terrorism act which defines terrorism as a heinous crime and penalizes it with life imprisonment or death. On still another front, in our war on criminality, we will be just as unrelenting. Crimes against women and children are particularly abominable. And I ask this Congress to pass without delay bills which impose harsh penalties for rape and for child prostitution, pedophilia, and child pornography. You and I know criminality coexists with and is emboldened by corruption in the bureaucracy, especially in the police. That is why we have undertaken once again a comprehensive reform and reorganization of the National Police. As we continue to read the Philippine National Police of misfits, we must also strengthen the hand and improve the lot of those who bear the burden of protecting us in our homes, in the streets, and in our workplaces. I ask this Congress for the early passage of the PNP Modernization Bill and the amendments to Republic Act No. 6975. This will enable the PNP to further professionalize, upgrade salaries and other benefits, acquire adequate communications and transport systems, and set up state-of-the-art crime laboratories.
These measures must be complemented by your passage of the Crime Control Act of 1995, which will harmonize the operations of our law enforcement agencies, particularly our campaign against those who are holding loose firearms against private armed groups and against criminal syndicates. We also need to raise the efficiency and safeguard the integrity of our judicial system. The executive and the judiciary have found the courage to cooperate to reform the criminal justice system through a recently established National Council on the Administration of Justice, or the NCAJ. Congress has already done a great deal to help along this process by setting up a fund estimated at 2 billion pesos for reforms in the judicial and prosecution service. Even as we seek justice and peace for all, we must reassure our people that our political system works and give them a stronger voice in the affairs of our nation. But this our people cannot have unless we change the mainspring of political power in this country from money, influence, and patronage to talent and merit. The urgent measures are to clean up the electoral system so that citizens can be sure that their votes are counted. <laughs> Open the positions of political power to all who aspire and are willing to compete and ensure that the wielders of power are accountable to the electorate. Our difficulty in achieving political reform, ladies and gentlemen, arises not only from the lack of enabling laws, but also from the weight of our traditional culture of palakasan and palusutan. Most of the rich and powerful still demand and often receive preferential treatment in the transactions of daily life, beginning with exemption from traffic rules to traffic walls for their monopolies. This focus on special privilege and special treatment we must now remove from our culture. We cannot enter into the 21st century with one foot stuck in the feudal era. As we speak of a culture of excellence, so must we cultivate a culture of responsibility and accountability. Those who deride our economic performance and social reforms as not having improved the lives of the poorest Filipinos use one of the oldest logic tricks in the book, building a straw man only to knock it down. Growth in a free market economy favors the better endowed regions and the better equipped segments of the economy, but only initially. As is well known, the long march to prosperity is measured in years and even decades. It is a journey we Filipinos have barely begun, although we can take comfort in the thought that each step taken brings us closer to our goal. But because the poor cannot wait, because in Gabriela Mistral's phrase, the child's name is today, we have intervened to put poverty alleviation at the center of government's concerns. We reject the trickle-down approach. Our social reform agenda focuses directly upon the 19 poorest provinces and on specific sectors who are the poorest of the poor. Thus, our approach to eradicate poverty is founded on three major 
interventions. One, we need to build up the absorptive capacity of the poor by enhancing the capability of non-government organizations and people's organizations such as cooperatives, livelihood associations, and self-help groupings that are dedicated to them. We are a long way from wiping out poverty. Right now, our more realistic goal is to prevent poverty from perpetuating itself. Our war against poverty must be fought by a strong army of citizens. And we must mobilize not only government, but the entire citizenry on the ra ra rallying cry of self-help and self-reliance. All hands, not just government, are needed to win this war. The impetus for any winning strategy should come from below by harnessing the energies of the poor themselves. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I ask Congress to formulate innovative ways to provide resources for training, organizational development, and capacity building of NGOs and people's organizations focused on poverty alleviation. We have allotted some 74 billion pesos in the 1996 budget for our social reform program. We also need to improve our mobilization of financial resources raised both here at home and from official development assistance, which are meant for the exclusive use of the poorest sectors. And we need to synergize, consolidate, and streamline all of government's strategies, programs, and agencies that address poverty alleviation into a more focused and better coordinated collective effort that reaches down to barangay level. We do, however, realize that the ultimate solution to poverty is providing enough productive and remunerative jobs and livelihood to our people. On my instruction, the National Economic Development Authority and the Department of Labor and Employment are currently working with representatives of Congress on a comprehensive employment strategy to create one million jobs a year and reduce employment to 6.5% by 1998. As we pursue our economic development efforts, we will also improve the delivery and coverage of basic services to provide the minimum basic needs of our people. Water services, electricity, housing, jobs and livelihood opportunities, credit support, among others. We will further accelerate easy credit support for small and medium-scale enterprises, or SMEs, even as our financial institutions have provided some 47 billion pesos worth of credit to them over the past two years, or about three times more than the previous 10-year period taken together. Our legislative agenda also includes urgent proposals for increasing family income and enhancing the welfare of our farmers, our fisher folk, our industrial workers, and our urban poor. We seek legislation to improve the urban poor's easier access to decent and affordable housing. And I ask this Congress to continue its predecessor's work of setting the framework of agrarian reform and modernizing agriculture as the foundation of industrialization and sustainable broad-based development. I ask you to give maximum legislative support towards the increase of the Agrarian Reform Fund and to pass the Irrigation Crisis Act if we are to make our small farmers competitive in the world.
Furthermore, I urge Congress not anymore to pass legislation except exempting more lands from the coverage of agrarian reform. I also ask Congress to pass the Fisheries Code, a law long delayed and eagerly awaited by our fisher folk. We must also reach out to our indigenous peoples so that they can take part in our communal effort at development without losing their cultural identity. I ask this Congress to establish a Cordillera Consultative Commission to pave the way for a Cordillera Autonomous Region and to pass the bill on ancestral domain so that we can respond to our indigenous people's clamor for the recognition of their ancestral lands. <clears throat> our Muslim communities we must bring faster into the nation's mainstream by providing a greater share of the resources for infrastructure and human resource development. On environmental protection, I ask this Congress to enact the proposed codes on forestry, the environment, and land use. We must institutionalize our common conviction that nature is not something to be abused, but God's blessing to be enhanced. For God intended man to live in harmony with nature, not to ravage it, but protecting nature and fighting pollution starts with the citizenry by keeping our homes, premises, and communities clean and green. <clears throat> our foreign policy today rests on three pillars, political security, economic diplomacy, and protection of Filipinos overseas. In recent weeks, I have ordered policy and procedural reforms to all government agencies and foreign missions concerned so that we can respond more promptly, adequately and effectively to the concerns, problems and difficulties of our new heroes, our overseas workers, of whom there are four million. Our diplomacy for development has brought dividends in trade investments and goodwill while renewing our friendships in the world. We initiated Southeast Asia's newest growth quadrangle, the East Asian Growth Area, or YAGA, as a founding member of the World Trade Organization. An urgent task of Congress is also to further harmonize our trade, investment, agricultural and industrial policies with our commitments under the Uruguay Round Agreement. This year, we chaired the group of 77, consisting of 135 nations, and we have a key role in the Non-Aligned Movement, or NAM. Next year, we shall host the Leaders' Summit of Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, or APEC, at which venue we will continue to champion the development of the human resources of our 18 member economies, believing that every economy should make human beings the center of its concerns. The Armed Forces Modernization Program enacted by the Ninth Congress enables us to improve our capability to defend our national territory and to enhance our influence in promoting regional security cooperation. In undertaking the program, self-reliance will continue to be our guiding principle. This we will push to new heights by matching research with technology and production expansion in country. But far more than merely acquiring or installing the latest equipment, the development of our human resources is the most meaningful component of our defense modernization. We need soldiers and highly dedicated, highly trained, forward-looking men and women in the ladder of command. 
Our relations with the United States, we must place on an even keel on the basis of trade, not aid, removing the residual bitterness of her departure from Philippine bases. On our dispute with China, our mischief reef, and the conflicting claims on the South China Sea, we have worked consistently to prevent this issue from breaking out into open conflict while proving to the world that we are prepared to defend our borders. In recent weeks, our diplomats have pushed for consensus on a code of conduct in the South China Sea that all claimants will respect. In Japan, far-reaching economic changes seem imminent which should further open its markets to our products and bring a fresh wave of Japanese investments into our country. In Southeast Asia, recent events carry forward our hopes for the eventual integration of its 10 countries. Vietnam is poised to become a member of ASEAN. Laos is already an ASEAN observer country. Cambodia has acceded to the Treaty of Amity and cooperation in Southeast Asia. And with the encouraging developments in Myanmar, we hope it too would soon be drawn into the ASEAN process. Together with our friends in the world, we must work for the reform of the United Nations system to make it a more effective instrument for multilateral peacekeeping. We seek the Senate's concurrence, therefore, on various treaties all aimed at enhancing our economic, social, political, technological, and cultural contacts in the global community. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, let me say a few words about the importance of good governance, which is the foundation of sustained development. We have turned around precisely because we first put the House of Government in order and created a better climate for cooperation between the legislative and executive branches. I cannot overemphasize our need to improve government's capacity and effectiveness. Our ultimate object is to assert the rule of law, to replace privilege with effectiveness, and establish the social cohesion and legal equality that characterize a working democracy. The Ninth Congress passed into history without acting on the bill on emergency powers to streamline the entire executive branch. I trust this Tenth Congress will have the will to do so. <clears throat> Management teachers remind us that there is a difference between efficiency and effectiveness. The public agency and the public servant can be efficient for as long as they fulfill their mandate within the law, even if that law is already outdated. Effectiveness, on the other hand, has to do with meeting objectives at the appointed hour. Effectiveness is doing the right thing at the right time. In its present condition, our bureaucracy is saddled with structures and systems fit only for a bygone age. An old bureaucratic joke asks the simple question. If it takes two ditch diggers two, di two days to dig a ditch, how long would it take for ditch diggers? The logical answer should be one day. But in real bureaucratic life, the correct answer is probably four days, or perhaps forever. Indeed, we have made government the employer of last resort. By constant addition, without regard to objectives, we have assembled a workforce too big to be effective, a workforce that spends an increasing amount of its time reworking rather than working and undoing rather than doing. <clears throat> to 
to fully support local government units in their effort to deliver basic services, we ask Congress to correct the imbalance between their financial resources and the actual cost of devolution to local government units under the local government code. I turn now to the, to the key legislative reform that I commend to this Congress for 1995, which is tax reform. As we move towards the 21st century, we must establish a progressive tax system capable of funding the inevitable requirements of development and modernization, while, simul while simultaneously relieving the burden from our poorer, poorer sectors. We must simplify our tax system, broaden its base, lower its rates, make it more progressive, economically efficient, and socially equitable, and eliminate areas of discretion that all too often lead to graft and corruption. In this reform effort, we need not adopt new tax measures. We can efficiently enforce or modify existing ones, rationalize our convoluted incentive system, improve collection efficiency, and strengthen our capability to prosecute and put behind bars tax cheats and tax frauds. Tax reform will also generate a recurring flow of funds that we need to invest in human capital, in improving the health, housing, education, skills, and productivity of our work people. Families stranded in low-income occupations cannot prepare their children to be the productive citizens of tomorrow. We must help those children gain access to, to opportunities for self-improvement. In practice, the equality the Constitution guarantees becomes a mere abstraction without a minimum amount of economic equality in terms of housing, of health care, of basic education. The poor are the focal point of government social services, which are, of course, financed through the taxation of the more comfortable and affluent among us. Those of us who still regard the state as no more than a night watchman, whose only duty is to safeguard private property, private property, live in an era long gone. If Philippine society is to become just and stable, if Philippine society is truly to transform itself, then we must ease the extremes of poverty and wealth left over to us from the ironies of history. Mr. Senate President, Mr. Speaker, ladies and gentlemen of the 10th Congress, on the eve of our centennial of Philippine independence, we find ourselves at the threshold of far-reaching change, change that promises to fulfill the dreams of our heroic generation of 1892 to 1898. Not only the world has changed, the very basics of human and economic development have changed. The ability to create knowledge is rapidly replacing manufacturing power as the crucial factor among competitive economies. Information technology, or IT, is the highway of the future, which compels the enactment of laws to promote this new sector of opportunity and challenges our science and business leaders to create our export niche for information technology products. We cannot remake this country without tearing open the old blinders and throwing away the old formulas. We will continue to develop only if we adapt and innovate continuously. Many so-called thinkers make a profession of predicting the collapse of all our endeavors. The best reply to this, ladies and gentlemen, to these prophets of doom, is the continued success of our programs.
Once upon a time, democracy was a millstone around our neck. Both those who sought to subvert the Philippine state and those who sought to, re to stop reform used democracy's means to bring Philippine democracy down. But Philippine-style democracy is our competitive edge today because democracy, by awakening and mobilizing ordinary people to the possibilities and potentials of their lives, enlarges tremendously our talent of enterprise, knowledge, and productivity. But let us not forget that the democratic way, by enlarging the latitude for debate and, dis and dissension, also demands harder work, greater cohesiveness, and social responsibility from every one of us. If our democracy is to adapt to the dynamism of society, culture, and politics, which is the wave of the future, then it must become more pervasive and more participatory. And government itself must become user-friendly. Its ruling principle must be to devolve, to decentralize, to deregulate, and to democratize. Ladies and gentlemen of the 10th Congress, in the drive to make our democracy work, we of the executive branch and you of the legislature must lead and achieve. I also urge those in media to enhance public awareness of our reform programs while they continue their support and impartial reporting of national issues. Let us remind ourselves that to achieve great deeds, we must not only plan and act, we must also believe in a shared vision towards which our energy, talent, and time must converge. At our centennial in 1998, I want to see, as surely you do, our people in command of their destiny, secure in their values, yet creative enough, audacious enough to meet new challenges with productive solutions. I want to see, as surely you of the 10th Congress also do, the beauty and richness of our land and our seas fully restored, a gift from this, our generation, to the future ones. And I want to see, as we all do, the glow of peace and hope and joy light up the face of every Filipino. Sa wakas, mga mahal na kababayan, pagsapit ng sandaan taon ng ating kasarinlan sa 98, pangarap nating magkaroon ang ating mga kababayan ng sapat na kakayahan hubugin ang kanilang kinabukasan, matibay ang loob at malikain ang isipan upang tugunan ang anumang suliranin. Pangarap nating may balik ang ganda at yaman ng ating lupain, kabundukan at karagatan bilang ating pamana sa mga darating pang salin lahi. Pangarap nating makitang muli ang liwanag ng kapayapaan sa ating bayan at pag-asa, sigla at karangalan ng bawat mamamayam Pilipino. Sa inyong lahat, maraming salamat. Mabuhay ang Pilipinas. Mabuhay ang ikasampong kongreso.
That was the State of the Nation address of the President of the Republic of the Philippines to the 10th Joint Session of Congress. It was uh, interrupted by applause 35 times, I counted. Um, more or less mine, yes. yes. Uh, <laughs> and um, it started promptly at 4 o'clock. <coughs> it is now... Uh, uh, this Joint Session is adjourned. It was called to order at 4 o'clock. Exactly. Uh, yeah. That was that was uh, quite impressive. Mm -hmm. You know, my and uh, the state of the nation was rather short, uh, simple, and uh, direct. As I was saying, uh, well, he did some tasking here. These are the things we need to do, and uh, we're willing to do all the sacrifices to do all of these things. And uh, it focuses on the individual. And uh, again, as I said, uh, it should be a a gold mine for any legislator. Uh, looking for work to do. Uh, uh, he mentioned a, lo a lot of concerns and a lot of uh, priorities. That's right. I, I think this address was uh, typical of the no-nonsense style of uh, the president, very straightforward. He outlined exactly what he, had, he expects uh, from this Congress. Uh, from the very beginning, he gave a lot of emphasis to deregulation and liberalization. He has asked for the dismantling of uh, the remaining protectionist barriers. Uh, for instance, the tariff reduction program, he has asked the repeal of certain laws, among them the retail trade law. Mm -hmm. um, aside from that, five other laws that he mentioned, which he has asked to be repealed or amended, includes the Investment Company Act of 1960, the Uniform Currency Act of 1950, the minimum capital requirement for foreign investors in wholesale and export uh, contained in negative list B and the deletion entirely of negative list C. The Financing Company Act of 1969, the Investment Houses Act of 1973 to allow unrestricted foreign investment in finance companies. You know, Maal, if you ask me, uh, there are two things that are noticeable in the speech. One is, uh, the President said there's no turning back on reforms. Uh, the tariff reforms have been put in place, uh, deregulation, liberalization. We're going to go full steam ahead. And this is what he said. And uh, so for those sectors still hoping that uh, things will change, then he said, no, that we're going full steam ahead on liberalization to create opportunities for people here. Now, the second one is, uh, it's a state of the nation, and yet he's asking for a repeal. Uh, usually you ask for enactment. Yes. Uh, here he's asking, alisin na natin yung mga blinders and the formulas of the past. So I think if we are sensitive enough on the messages of the SONA, uh, the president is saying we're moving up, uh, let's not drag ourselves down. That's right. And uh, you said it uh, quite, quite uh, clearly, uh, Oka. I mean, uh, he's asked for repeals rather than you know, new, new laws to be enacted. He has also said, as you said, that there is no stopping us now. I mean, we've moved forward and we'll continue to move forward. As a matter of fact, one of the most applauded paragraphs was when he said that uh, to address the doomsayers and uh, those who are just waiting for this country to trip, the best answer to them is just to continue with our successes. That's right. Uh, Maan, you know, I, I think uh, for many of us in government, this should be uh, a source uh, uh, well of work. It's a watershed. Uh, president has reached his uh, midterm. We're going into the second half and beyond. Uh, what he's in effect saying is that we have laid the foundation. Now the focus is on the person, the social reform agenda. And as a means of achieving, uh, giving better opportunities to our people, he has chosen a free market orientation, looking outward, more competition, more demand on ourselves, more sacrifice. But, well, this is the only way to do it. Well, the president has said it quite well. He is now focusing on getting Manila to compete as the financial and trade center of this part of the world. Now, let's uh, pass it on for a while to Shello and let's get some uh, reactions from the floor. Shello? Thank you, Man and Governor Orbas. What was significant about the president's speech was the fact that he has posed a big challenge to the legislature to work hard to make sure that the social reform agenda is translated into concrete action. The President uh, called on Congress to help translate into action the creation of at least a million jobs per year. He has also called for a reduction in unemployment by 6.5% by the year 1998. 
He has also called for an increase in the agrarian reform funding to make sure that agriculture is a foundation of the country's development. But I'm sure a lot of people would like to know, are these goals realistic? Are these goals achievable? I believe that without the cooperation of both the executive and legislative branches of government, this cannot be achieved. So it is important for cohesion and consensus to make this a reality. And I think what is good news, Maan, is that uh, he has mentioned that the, the focus of Congress should be uh, PNP reforms to ensure a more efficient anti-crime drive. And I think that is good news for both DILG Secretary Rafael Lunan and PNP Chief Recaredo Sarmiento. But of course, as what was mentioned earlier, the social reform agenda would be the focus of uh, this year's, of the 10th Congress. And for the urban poor, we hope that Congress will be able to address the needs of the 19 poorest provinces of the country. We, are, we know that we have a long way to wipe out poverty in this nation. The President has also dared a lot of congressmen to make sure the reforms are really instituted to carry out the benefits of progress. And he has mentioned six major tasks for Congress to concentrate on. This includes the adopt adoption of policies to make sure that the Philippines would be competitive, competitive especially in the world economy. The President has also called for the stamping out of criminality and an end in laxity in the criminal justice system. He has also called for capability and self-reliance, strengthening of foreign policy, and the removal of protectionist barriers.